Donnie. Yeah. Got a German here wants to die for country. Oblige him. Bye bye. See you later. Germany had been one of the most dominant forces in football for a period spanning 70 years, having won four World Cup titles since 1954, trailing only Brazil's Hall of Five. Winners in 1954, 1974, 1990, and 2014, Germany had also finished as runners-up four times while reaching the semi-finals another five times. But those successes are now a distant memory clouded by the desert sand in Qatar and cheers by neutrals, with the current German national team a shadow of their former powerful self. Hansi Flick's men were overwhelmed and below par at this year's tournament, failing to show never give up qualities and the conviction that any game, no matter the score, could be turned. Instead, it was the Japanese who took a page out of their playbook and came from a goal down to score twice in the second half and snatch a 2-1 victory. A similar run of events against Spain in Japan's final group game saw them top Group E, the supposed group of death, and consequently kicked the Germans out of the tournament. In the end, that wholly avoidable opening day defeat to Japan was the result that cost Germany qualification. They can now go home and protest against FIFA some more. Dude, are you gay? Fair to say the Germans took the champion's curse for two straight World Cups. Either that, or France passed along theirs to escape their group unscathed. But where did it all go wrong for Germany in Qatar 2022? Let's find out and more in today's video. Despite a star-studded squad, Flick's team was a patchwork of inexperienced players on the international stage. With Timo Werner ruled out due to injury, his choice of center forwards was 29-year-old Nicholas Fulkrug from Werder Bremen, who? who earned his first national cap just days before the World Cup, and Dortmund's Yusufa Mukoko, the youngest player in the tournament having only turned 18. Despite creating numerous good chances against Japan, Germany weren't able to kill the game. As has so often been the case in recent months, a proper goal scorer is still missing. Unwanted memories of the group stage exit in 2018 immediately rang louder after the loss. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait. But Leon Goretzka took heart from the fact that his club team, Bayern Munich, the side that made up most of Germany's starting 11 faced similar problems this autumn but found winning ways by rediscovering that greed and conviction in front of goal. The elephant in the room, however, is the question of quality, as what Bayern manager Julian Nagelsmann had done to reinvigorate his team was to incorporate an orthodox striker in Eric Maxim Chupo Moting back into the attacking lineup. Germany, by contrast, started all three group games with either Havertz or Muller as a false nine. Unbelievable to think that Germany, the team with the highest expected goals and goal difference at the World Cup group stage, is already going home. On the other end, a leaky defense has been an issue for months, if not years. Niklas Sula, Nico Schlotterbeck, David Rahm, and substitute Lukas Klostermann are decent defenders, but certainly not among the best. Then again, when Flick has selected 12 different back fours across his 17 games in charge, one can hardly expect a well-oiled machine. On a side note, I'm glad at least Flick didn't pick Emre Chan to the tournament, as the guy offers a call when he plays for Germany. Their whole defensive structure remains plagued by positional errors and poor communication, and their collective lack of composure in the face of Japan's ascendancy was a stark contrast to the pragmatism and maturity of their 2014 World Cup predecessors. Case in point, Takuma Asano's narrow angle strike to down Germany had come from a direct long ball launched from deep inside the Japanese half. Schlotterbeck, who was marking Asano, didn't fully realize the gravity of the situation until it was too late. In fact, in almost a mirroring of that same goal, Germany again displayed Sunday league-like defending against a similar long ball by Costa Rica, and they would have conceded from it had it not been for some inspired goalkeeping by Manuel Neuer. And here's a fun fact for you guys. Since Euro 2016, Germany have conceded a goal in every game they've played at major competitions and went behind in each except against Japan and Costa Rica. That, by any standard, is appalling. If defenders can't rely on attackers to take their chances, attackers can't rely on defenders not to give away silly goals. And some of their players will wonder whether their teammates are truly up to the task. 
No cap, the streets will always remember those three precious minutes when Japan and Costa Rica were both on course to qualify at the expense of Spain and Germany. In short, Germany are still too harmless up front and too error prone at the back. Issues that are neither new nor easily repairable, leading to their group stage exit feeling self-inflicted. So far, the generation change after the 2014 World Cup triumph seems to have failed. The absence of a natural leader on the pitch in the mold of past greats like Franz Beckenbauer, Lothar Matthäus, or Bastian Schweinsteiger, the one player who would take responsibility at tough times to guide the team, was glaring. Team captain, Manuel Neuer, can't lead the team from his goal while it felt like midfielders Ilkay Gundogan and Joshua Kimmich shied away from this role despite being some of the most experienced players of the lot. Thomas Muller, who was dropped from the national team a few years ago only to be brought back, is far from the player who lifted the trophy in 2014 and has already begun hinting at international retirement after the Costa Rica game. And their leader in defense is this guy. From this guy to this guy. It becomes a question of what might have been if Flick hadn't left veteran Mats Hummels out of his World Cup squad after the 33-year-old enjoyed an excellent first half of the season with Dortmund. Germany could have certainly benefited from his composure and experience, as he showed against top-tier opponents like Man City and Eintracht Frankfurt at the club level. Nobody has said it yet, but confidence in Hansi Flick will have taken a hit as well on the back of some questionable decisions that he made. Going back to the game against Japan, at the very moment the game was slipping away from Germany's grasp, Flick first brought off Gundogan, their best player in the game, and then the creative linchpin Jamal Musiala of Bayern, who had at times single-handedly tormented Japan's back line. Goretzka and Jonas Hoffmann, their respective replacements, are fine players, but without the Pep Guardiola-educated Gundogan in particular, Germany lost the calmness on the ball that had seen them dominate the game in the first half. Things became progressively wild as the search for a second goal turned into a quest for a winner and then into a desperate hunt for an equalizer. By the end of the game, Flick threw on Fulkrug and Mukoko. Like the late introduction of Mario Götze, the 2014 World Cup final match winner who had last featured for his country five years ago, these measures smacked of desperation rather than careful consideration of the needs of the situation. Many among the Bayern fanbase have judged the success of Nagelsmann's stint at the club based not only on Flick's tactical approach, but also his record-breaking 6-2 postseason. Unpopular opinion, say what you want about Nagelsmann, but he is not as stubborn. Flick was not only told left and right about using the number 9, but also saw firsthand what having full crook on the pitch did for their attacking play. And yet, he chose to use Muller again as a false 9 against what? a low block. In both games against Spain and Costa Rica, Germany started playing real football when Fulkrug was subbed on. But Flick, whose success with Bayern relied heavily on feeding balls into the box for Lewandowski, could not see it at all. And it was this stubbornness that played a huge part in costing Germany knockout qualification. This is the worst period ever in German football history by performance. The main lesson from Germany's World Cup capitulation? They must sharpen up defensively and manage games better. It's too much for a fine attacking play to compensate for, even with the increasingly wonderful Jamal Musiala edging closer to superstar status. He was very much the only bright spark in Germany's otherwise underwhelming campaign, successfully completing a ridiculous 34 dribbles in just 3 group games, 6 more than any other player at the tournament. The fact that Musiala remained an attacking spark for a dysfunctional and collapsing German side against Costa Rica is a testament to his resilience and ability to perform under pressure. Deep reforms will now be required on both team and federation level if the Mannschaft is to rebuild their reputation as a team to be reckoned with. Flick has plenty of homework ahead of the upcoming Euros on home soil in two years' time. There's no appetite at the moment for a managerial change within the German FA, but he must do a lot better at the next attempt if he is to get another shot at a World Cup in 2026. What went wrong for Germany at this World Cup? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. As always, if you enjoyed, consider subscribing as it really helps the channel out.